My name is Jade Floyd, Vice President of Communications at the Case Foundation and the Case Impact Network. Like many of you, I've sat in moments of reflection and meditation about the state of our globe over these past few months. As a mother, as a wife, as a patron, and as a human, I've hurt for the people who have been savaged by violence in the communities they've called home. I've watched as local businesses that are dear to me shutter their doors. And like all of you, I've seen the social upheaval unfold, igniting a global call to action. In my own personal moments of darkness, I've also seen glimmers of hope, a path filled with thousands of individuals who have rose up in this time of despair and shouted from the rooftops, this will not stand. This isn't who we are as a nation. This isn't who we are as humans. A tectonic shift in the world led by women and men, black, white, and brown young and old from every community across the nation. A moment in our history where we've all come together despite our differences to communicate that we must, that we can and that we will do better. At that same time, we've seen foundations and philanthropists answering this clarion call, recognizing the importance of mobilizing their resources and their dollars in support of social justice and equity and for small business impacted by these historic events. Many of you are behind the scenes crafting the messages and thought leadership for your institutions that is challenging us to drive a narrative and reality that is rooted in facts and equality and social justice and dignity and fairness and for what's just plain right. For that, I commend you. And I thank you for the countless hours and the hard work that you've put in. As I take the reins of chair of the communications network this year, I do so with the lens on the changing dialogues and the sentiments of our nation and of our globe that we're witnessing at this very moment. Business as usual is no longer acceptable, not only for our institutions and the companies that we serve, but for our communities and for us as a human race. So what does this mean for each of us as communicators, as strategists and as leaders? How can we in our current professional capacity use our tools, our resources and our expertise to truly drive change in the world and stand for what is good. As communicators, we ignite good by changing the dialogues happening across media, social, and digital channels. Today, you tune in with hundreds of communicators and strategists like yourself. We hold the power to shape global dialogues, not just within the media or our internal institutions or the audiences we tap, but within our homes, within our personal networks, and within our souls. So, as we navigate this new reality, this new normal we call life together. I hope that each of you find time to write your own manifesto. Reflect on what we fight for in our work and in our homes and in our communities. Together, we're a powerful force for good that I am proud to lead as board chair. And I welcome each of you to be. Now, when we say that we don't want this to be a conference, our ambition is for this to be a gathering. I think there is a distinction. I think there is a difference. When you write, when you communicate, when you use your capacity for advocacy, you are creating space for people to see themselves in other people's stories. I'm Dele, and welcome to ComNet B. Welcome. I'm Luz Wanger. Hey, ComNet. Chelsea in LA. Hi, I'm Kendall. Hi, I'm Maureen, pronoun she, her. Hey, ComNet. I'm Chelsea Dade with Communicate for Health Justice. Hey, y'all. Welcome. My name is Andre Legister. Hi, I'm Betsy Lopez Wagner. Welcome to ComNet. Hey everybody, it's Sean Gibbons. Welcome to V. Uh, well, welcome to my basement, really. That's where we're at right now. And I'm grateful that all of you are here. Well, not here, but with us for the next couple of days. And listen, gang, this is going to be new. It's obviously different. Uh, we are facing so many amazing, extraordinary, crushing challenges. 
Uh, but I am grateful that you are making the time for us right now, and hopefully you'll be able to be with us over the next couple of days. My job, by the way, I'm Sean. I should probably introduce myself. Maybe you saw me in the uh, video just a second ago. I was wearing a jacket. Today, I'm not going to lie, I'm not wearing pants. Got shorts on, but a little bit different for all of us. Uh, I want to uh, just make sure that you all understand kind of what the plan is. Everything that we've got planned is available to you now on comnetworkvirtual.com. Org. That's where all the detail is. So you can explore that and you can add things to your calendar. And we get it. This is a time when if you're a parent if you're like me, just up above, we got Zoom school going on. Uh, you are probably going to be jumping in and out of this if as, as you can. Chances are work's calling on you more, not less. So if you're not able to grab something uh, live and be with us, we understand that. And so everything's going to be available to you on demand. We'll make video recordings available. Give us, you know, 90 minutes, maybe two hours. Our goal is by the end of today, everything that's been up on the screen will be up online. So you can come back to the portal, which is what you're in now. We're calling it the portal or the control room or the lobby. Uh, and you can find that stuff later. So you want to share that or, or watch something a little bit later that you weren't able to get to. By all means, please do that. Uh, I want to thank a few people before we get into the sessions that you clicked into, which is a couple of amazing conversations. I had the good fortune of getting to sit in with uh, Dr. Judy Monroe from the CDC Foundation and also with Kyle and Nathaniel. If you're in that room, uh, you're in for a real treat and you're not going to miss either, frankly, because, again, you can watch them both uh, later if you wish or watch the other one that you're missing live. You can watch that later. Um, suffice to say, just want to thank a few folks and do a little bit of housekeeping, make sure everybody got, has what they need to get through today and, and this journey that we're all on together. So first, a couple of uh, moments of just gratitude and thanks. And the, the first thank you has to come to you. You're taking a big chance by being with us, by being part of this community. We have nearly 2,000 people with us joining online, either live or on demand. And that's by far the largest gathering we've ever hosted at the network. So last year in Texas, we know everything's bigger in Texas, and it was about 950 folks, and, and here almost 2,000. I think we ended up at about 1,980-ish. A few folks we let in late today. Um, suffice to say, we are grateful to every single one of you and so happy that you're healthy and well. And do hope that you have a sense of kind of what we're all about at the network, which is this real culture of community, and it's driven by kindness and generosity. So please make sure that you're being uh, good to one another and participating in the chat is going to be much more meaningful to you. The content that we're going to offer you, I hope, is really helpful and useful to you. We think it will be. But we're also mindful that uh, the best resource that exists out there is you and the folks who are around us. Uh, in fact, Mark Morgan, uh, our old colleague and friend, uh, observed a comment a couple of years back uh, that you can see some absolutely wonderful things when you gather with the network. But the most important thing is the people sitting next to you. Well, this year we're not sitting next to each other because of, well, you know why. But we do have each other uh, uh, available either through the chat or we're also gathering on social. So you can find each other on Twitter, Instagram, whatever your particular poison is. Uh, and the hashtags we're using there are ComNetLive, C-O-M-N-E-T. Excuse me, I got that wrong. ComNetworkV, hashtag ComNetworkV or hashtag comms for good. All right, a couple of other people I just need to thank very, very quickly. You know them and you admire them as I do. Stefan Lanford, the former network board chair, he just concluded his term. Uh, he has been an incredible, uh, steady, and inspiring uh, partner and friend to me and to all of you. And so we are just incredibly grateful for his service. And we're fortunate, hopefully you've seen the news, we are welcoming a new leadership. You just saw Jade a moment ago, and she is being joined by Erica Pelletro, our new uh, Vice Chair Erica comes in from the Ford Foundation. We're also welcoming three new board members as we're gathering today. Anusha Ali Khan from Wikimedia Foundation, Virginia McMullen from the International Budget Partnership, and Daphne Moore from the Walton Family Foundation. So we're grateful for their guidance and their leadership uh, and the journey that they're going to be on with us over these next couple of years. These next couple of years are going to be... Well, we will see, right? We're all dealing with deep ambiguity as we look into the future. Also want to make sure that I acknowledge all of my friends and colleagues who've been playing a tremendous role in burning the candle on both ends and finding other candles beyond that. Uh, and that is the team from the network uh, HQ. And so that's Carrie Klein, who is the mastermind behind all of this. If you see stuff that you like, Carrie gets credit. Uh, Tristan Mahabir, Yab Sarah Ferris, Kareem Alston, Amrit Dillon, uh, Imani, and Tracy Mitchell have been doing an absolutely extraordinary job bringing this to you, as well as the tech crew. We're all learning as we go. Uh, we were up late into the night trying to figure this all out, but hopefully it's going to go off without a hitch. But I would ask, granted, 
you know what? This is new for us. So extend us a little bit of grace if something goes wrong. By all means, be in touch. But do know we're all doing our very, very best. And we've been working on this for months to bring this together. And we're glad we're finally all here. I also want to make sure I acknowledge all the folks who are serving as community leaders, all those folks coming in from V+. Plus. There's about 48 of you. I think there's about 365 of us that are part of this V+. Plus experience, which is really focused on not only the things we'll all be doing together over the next three days, but an extended experience over the next three months where we're going to be building community and connections in addition to learning together. Together. We're excited about that. And of course, you're here because V is freight. We hope you made a donation to a local Atlanta nonprofit since we weren't able to be with that wonderful folks in that city today. Uh, but uh, the folks from uh, a number of organizations that you're seeing here on the screen or you will be seeing on the screen over the next couple of days, we went to them earlier this year and we said, we have this idea. We know it's important to gather. Could you help us? And an extraordinary number of folks did. And, and because of that reason, we were able to make V free. So we are incredibly grateful to all of them. Um, I want to close by uh, opening uh, our session with something that's actually going to close us out on Friday. And so uh, Joy Harjo, who is the U.S. Poet Laureate, uh, has written her latest book. It's called An American Sunrise. I hope you've read this or you're aware of it, but maybe not. But I think this is a nice place of departure for all of us. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read a poem that she's written called Directions to You. And if you're curious, Joy will be with us on Friday afternoon. She will close out our gathering together. Uh, this song, or excuse me, this poem, I'm a little nervous, gang. Directions to you. Follow them. Stop. Turn around. Go the other way. Left. Right. Mine. Yours. We become lost. Unsteady. Take a deep breath. Pray. You will not always be lost. You are right here in your time, in your place. North, star, guidance as we look up to the brightest white, hoping it leads you to where you want to go, hoping that it knows where you should be. We find our peace here in the white, gather our strength, our breath, and learn how to be. East, the sun rises red, Morning heat on our faces, even on the coldest morning. The sun creates life, energy, nourishment. Gather strength, pull it in, be right where you are. South, butterfly flits, spreads yellow beauty. We have come to this moment in time, step by step. We don't always listen to directions. We let the current carry us, push us force us along the path. We stumble, get up, and keep moving. West, sunsets brings darkness, brings black. We find solitude, time to take in breath and pray. Even in darkness, you can be found. Call out even in a whisper or a whimper, you will be heard. To find, to be found, to be understood, to be seen, Heard, felt, you are, breath, you are, memory, you are, touch, you are, right here. So let's begin. Hi, um, my name is Kyle Tibbs Jones and I'm one of the founders of The Better Southerner. And I'm here today with my friend, Nathaniel Smith. Hi, Nathaniel. Hello, uh, how are you? Nathaniel is the Chief Equity Officer and founder of the Project for Southern Equity. Did I get that right? The Partnership for partnership. Southern Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, hi, it's good to see you. Hi, it's good, it's good to see you as well. We're here to talk about communications for good and moving this world along. I'm excited about our conversation. I, I you know, of course, you know, I, I've been a, a great and big fan of the Bitter Southerner since the beginning. And so, you know, to have an opportunity for us to spend good time together is something that I've been looking forward to. 
Thank you. Me too. Right back at you. Uh, just so everyone in the audience knows, we uh, at The Bitter Southerner, have, during the social unrest and the protests and the march, marches this uh, summer, we started a project where we were selling t-shirts and giving money to boots on the ground and organizations fighting for social and racial justice. And uh, that's how Nathaniel and I met because we supported uh, yes. that partnership. Equity. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And and we, we were so appreciative yeah. of, of, of that support. And um and here we are now, you know, I thinking know. of ways that we can uh continue to conspire uh together as we continue to move the to work to advance towards a better south. I, I love that. So I think our project here today is um to talk about communications for good, but I think we should start by talking about how we've arrived at what we're doing these days, how you and I have landed in these spots. Why don't you go first? Tell us like what you do, right. and how you came to this. Right, right. So um, as you said before, I, I have the honor really of, of serving the community in the South, of the South as the founder and chief equity officer of the Partnership of Southern Equity. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that is working to advance what we call a new Southern agenda uh, for racial equity and shared prosperity in the American South. Uh, we, are, we are a deep, deep believer that in order to change the nation, we first have to change the South. And in order to do that, you need strong uh, leaders, you need strong organizations, you need strong ideas, strong stories um, in order to move that work forward. And, you know, for me, it's just always been a part of my life. Um, you know, it's something that has always been uh, a driver for me personally. I, I mean, I had a chance to grow up in an environment where many leaders who understood the importance of the South sacrificed their lives, reputation, health, uh, well-being to, to move the South and the nation forward. So, I, I mean, I really look at the work that I do, not as a job, but, but as an assignment, really, as, 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 you know, that I'm running this marathon race. And, and at the end of the day, it's just my leg to, to carry the baton. Uh, but that is what I believe. Nathaniel, tell um, everyone in the audience about, the, this is in your DNA, your fam, talk about growing up yeah yeah you know and it's always strange to talk about it because i had nothing to do with it you know it's just, it was just the universe's, this, yeah the universe's this decision to put me in a very unique and special situation um my parents had an opportunity to be involved um in the civil rights movement and work for the southern christian leadership conference under uh dr martin luther king Junior, as well as Ralph David Abernathy and Joseph Eccles Lowry. Um, and those experiences growing up, you know, um, in that environment um, really, really shaped my worldview and, and really helped to uh, not only help, help me understand the importance of people in public policy, but also the importance of the South. Um, as relates to our nation. And, you know, it just always, you know, stuck with me and, and it really um, encouraged me not just being around the kind of folks that you would read about in the newspaper or read and learn about during Black History Month, but, but the silent heroes, right? The, the invisible heroes, the, the people who people may not necessarily be aware of, the ones that gave so much of themselves and will never and, and most people will never know their names you know those are the people who really touched my life and inspired me to continue to to run this race i hope you'll write a memoir someday well well we'll see and and of course you know i i Maybe the southerners should publish it well we'll, we'll see you know i, I want to work up to that you know i i want to i want it to be earned so i gotta yeah. keep working you're, but, you're earning it you're earning it but I would, I would also love to just hear about your story because, you know, a lot of times people assume, and I think that is how communications can be sometimes used to stifle courage. You know, we, right. we hear about these dynamic and, and great leaders, you know, that came before us 
who, you know, uh, were larger than life. And, and, and sometimes we forget that change happens through everyday people, right? It, it happens through a commitment by uh, of everyday people to play a role in, in doing this work. I would even submit to you even more than the larger than life leaders. And so that is why I just appreciate your your story so much. And, you know, if you don't mind sharing, I think I think the audience would really uh, um, benefit from hearing about your story. Well, thanks, Nathaniel. I am actually absolutely one of those everyday people. Um, I didn't grow up the way you did. And I, I, I have a much more humble story. I just um, I didn't fall into this work. <clears throat> I've been in communications my whole career. I've worked in television and film and PR and advertising. Um, I've been doing social media for 10 years and we started The Bitter Southerner seven years ago. And when we got together, um, it was going to be um, actually a cocktail blog, <laughs> thus The Bitter Southerner. And uh, when we got together, we're like, this is so much bigger. The world has all these misperceptions about the South. Um, and no one is telling those sto those smart stories. We were either hearing um, stories about Honey Boo Boo and Duck Dynasty on one end of the spectr spectrum. And, and then Atlanta Housewives too, right? Yeah, that that's on one end of the spectrum. And on the other end of the spectrum was the uh, super affluent, you know, um, silver tea service and bespoke shotgun kind of stuff. So nobody was telling smart stories right down the middle. But, but the way I arrived at this is that, um, I just think it's in my blood. My, I grew up in um, North Georgia in Dalton, Georgia. And my dad was a engineer for the Department of Transportation. He built highways. And so at some point in his life, he had a religious experience and became a devout um, Christian and began a lay ministry that he he's 86 and he's still you know very involved in it and i watched him and we uh didn't we're, we're not on the same at the same exact place with what he's involved in and how he is a missionary but i definitely have that missionary and uh, spirit so i call the bitter southerner my work that is my work that's similar to my dad's that's how we relate to each other and it's a good thing but um but seven years ago, we decided to, to start telling stories. We had no money. Um, people were so into the cause and in, into this movement that they saw us starting that uh, photographers and writers, um, everyone worked for free for the first year. They had volunteered their, their words and their photographs and their illustrations. It was an amazing time. <clears throat> Here we are seven years later, you know, we have a, like, we're halfway through the year and, you know, we have a million engagements. We have you know, we're about to reach big numbers across our emails and social and all that stuff. And we've built this community that cares about not only the South. So when we started this, our, our thoughts were the bitter Southerner for a better South. Then in 2016, there was an election and we were all like, whoa, it's a better country. It's, you know, we need to work on a better, it's bigger than the South, but, um, but we're all from here. So that's our focus. But and then um, Me Too, and now with what's going on in the world in 2020, it's our focus um, continues to evolve. But um, anyway, we're so glad we're here. And mm. that's a very circuitous route to tell you how I arrived at the Bitter Southerner, but it's been a cir circuitous route. And I tell you, you know, when, when you think about the amount of time and effort and commitment that it took to bring the bitter southerner where it is today. And, and I would be so humble as to say where the partnership of Southern Equity is today. Both of those efforts are stand on the foundation of love, right? A, a deep love of the American South, a, a love that compelled us to try to show up in a way that would help to move the South along uh, towards the place that it could be. And, you know, I, I wanted to just create a space and, and just talk a little bit about that love and, 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 and ask you to really talk about why, why, why do you love the South? Why did you love the South so much that love became a verb for you? Why, why, why? 
Nathaniel, you're going to make me cry. Um, I do get emotional when I talk about this, so I'll try not to, but uh, this is home. And home is hard. You know, family is hard. Home is hard. This is, this is where we're from. And uh, when we started this publication or this, this media company, we wanted to tell authentic stories of, about, we want to tell the truth mm. and the truth is not always easy. And so we were staring down hard, hard topics and, um, and we had to figure out a way to make it palatable, um, not easy for people, but, but keep people engaged. So if one week we had Killer Mike like staring into the camera and telling you what for, the next week we might do a story on uh, azalea bushes. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like we had to keep the rhythm and the narrative going um, so that we kept people engaged. And little by little people became, they're like, oh yeah, this is what y'all do. You tell us, you're, you're sharing stories that tell the truth. Right. And, um, so a little bit of looking back and telling the truth about where we've come from here in our home, in our place in the South, um, but also very optimistic and forward thinking about pushing forward to the future and sharing with the world, like how much cool stuff is going on here. Mm -hmm. You know, how many people, how many brilliant creatives there are and how many, you know, the scientists and the politicians and people like you, Nathaniel, that are doing the work, like we uh, we're sharing these stories and they just hadn't been shared before. Mm -hmm. so we found that the world was hungry for what was good about this place, what was hard and what was uh, not easy, but also what was good and optimistic about the, the American South. Yeah. And I, and I think the the bitter Southerner just plays such an important role in kind of elevating a new narrative uh, for the South that pushes back against the historic narratives that have not only uh, minimized the ability for people outside of the South to get involved, but have also um, helped to maintain um, the level of inequities and injustices that we see right. and experience in the South every day. And I think for me, you know, the South is just such a very complex and complicated place. You know, it is the place of gone with the wind, but also Waffle House, right? You know, it's the place of outcasts, you know, but at the same time, you know, the, the history of slavery, right? And, and, and it's that complexity that um, inspires me every day to try my best to reconcile that within the context of how people are provided an opportunity to show up in this world and, and also understanding that history and under that history, the, the struggles, the sacrifices, the constant tension that has been ever present um, in the South. Um, we talk about a lot that, that line from that drive-by trucker song, the duality of the Southern. Oh, it, it is. It is. I mean, you know, not, not to be overly controversial, but, you know, to, to be in the, in, in the antebellum South during a moment of chattel slavery and actually have a slave master um, um, have children out on the plantation picking cotton at the same time, right? So to actually be a white man, but also have black children that you are utilizing as free labor and to be able to reconcile that within the context of your culture and your religion, it doesn't get more complex than that, right? So, so the South is a very complex place, but it is also a place of, of hope um, is a place of resilience. It is a place of courage. It is a, is a place of faith, deep faith. And also it, it is a place of swag, right? And, and, and that is, is, is what compels me every day to fully, fully, hopefully play a role in allowing all people in the South who've contributed to it to be in a potential to reach their full, to be in a position to reach their full potential. Right. One thing we see all the time um, 
is all the people who left the South, you know, that have just got, just hightailed it out of here, right? And um, they have found the bitter Southerner and they are like, you are, you are, you're, t when I, like, I live in Seattle, I live in Paris, I live in Prague, and I, my friends go, how are you even from there? It's so, comp they're just like, how are you, and they say, I now ask them to read The Bitter Southerner because you are showing them what's great and what I miss and what I'm nostalgic for and what I long for about my home, but you're also you know, not staring down those hard, those hard truths that mm. the complex part. Yeah. Uh, so, that, so it's like maintaining hope um, and, and, uh, and pushing things forward in a time that seems really hard. I mean, the 2020, I mean, could we have a more, um, Oh my goodness. Messaging. And I mean, we're talking to corporate communications folks and people who are like, figuring out messages every single day. We're in the hardest year of our lives. Yes, yes, yes. And in many, many ways, um, the issues and challenges that we're facing um, were have been undergirded and exacerbated by the experiences and failures and successes of the American South. You know, um, you know, one of my heroes is is a gentleman by the name of James Baldwin, who was a great uh, social commentator and and one of one of the um, just larger than life intellectual giants that we had in the '60s. And you know, one of the things that he would always say is that history is the present, and and in many ways we can ex we see that now more I think than ever before with you know the COVID-19 challenges that we're facing, the disproportionate impacts on communities of color, and in particular in the South Black people um, in Georgia, um, because of the history of structural racism. And also um, when we see the uprisings and the, and, the, and, the, and the pushback from the uprisings and the, the, this framing around law and order and with order, in my opinion, being a code word for white supremacy, right? We begin to kind of experience what I believe and why the bitter Southern and PSC is so important is, 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 is a new force that is, is emerging to push back against what I call the pan Confederacy, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the pan Confederacy similar to how people in Paris and in other incredible places are reading a bit of Southerner, because even though they're not in the South, they have a connection to the South. I believe that in many ways, white supremacists around the world have a connection to the South. That is one of the reasons why we're seeing these challenges around Confederate statues and, and people around the world fighting and pushing to maintain that order and that, and that visual, right? because they are connected to something bigger than place. It is an ideology. And I really believe at the end of the day, when you look at where we are, whether it be COVID-19 or the uprisings or the other challenges that we're facing, there is now a fight, right, for our future, which is really a fight for ideas in right. which ideas will actually be the drivers for our new to and better tomorrow. And that is why, in my opinion, the work around strategic communications um, is so important because we are in a fight for ideas right now. Right. And, and, and whatever ideas end up um, being planted in the ground and fertilized and, and, and the ideas that will grow, in my opinion, will be the ideas that shape our world. That's one thing I wanted to talk about today. I was hoping we would get around to this about what worries us. And ideas are powerful, the good ones and the bad ones, right? And I, what one thing that's worrying me right, right now is how do we get people to the polls? Mm. How do we get people to vote? Um, that message is complicated. It if is. We're, if we're talking about strategic messaging and, and corporate communications and communications, and storytelling, how do we get people to the polls in a pandemic when everything is super complicated, when the postal service is in jeopardy, you know, our, our ballots are in jeopardy, like 
that is that's something that I that keeps me up at night. I've got to figure. Well, it's it, we have to figure that out. <laughs> you know? And it's tough. And, and I think again, I think it goes back to why our connection to history mm -hmm. uh, and why history is, is the present has to undergird and drive, you know, our belief in the importance of voting. Um, why would a woman like a Fannie Lou Hamer um, with a minimal education um, step outside of sharecropping um, and leave her family to go register to vote, knowing that registering to vote could mean the end of her life and she mm -hmm. actually had to leave town because she tried to register to vote, right? right. What, what compels someone with that historical trauma to continue to go and register to vote, even though they would know that the proctor would put a, a, a jar of jelly beans in front of them and say, if you tell me how many jelly beans are in this jar, we'll give you an opportunity to register to vote, right? right. It, 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 it is the constant struggle for humanity, right? And, and how people are considered human or not that this vote and, and where we are should be framed, that, that it's not just about democracy. It's right. not just about maintaining a strong participatory democracy. It's about what, what can we do as a community to continue to move towards an idea that everybody is valuable and precious under the sun. And, and, and that is what this is about. This is about humanity and, 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 by, and people fighting for their man, humanity through the democratic process. Right. Um, and, and I think um, if, if we just allow it to continue to be about, you know, the technicality of things or even about the elections coming up, we're, we're, not, we're missing, we're missing something. Um, and, you know, I, you know, why would, you know, and, and again, you know this better, than, uh, than me as a communicator, but but why would people be willing in a, in a pandemic to walk around without a mask, okay. knowing what the science is saying about COVID-19? It's because it is about their own personal values and beliefs that have now transcended science, right? And, 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 and so again, this election can't just be about voting to put right. people in office. It, it should be about affirming our humanity as, and, 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 and affirming the humanity of others. And in my opinion, that is the pathway towards ensuring that we get a strong turnout. I, I agree. I just feel like the um, turnout if we can, I agree with all of that. I just want people to get there in I order know. to get some of this um, alternative messaging out of power. Right, yeah. And the smoking and, of the flames. Yeah. Right. And, and, and we're probably not supposed to delve into politics in this talk. I have no idea. But yeah, I think right. it's a big challenge for us as communicators. Like, how can we get, we have two months to, to uh, drive home a message. We do. And, and there's an urgency around that message. And I think, you know, regardless of, of who you vote for, you matter and, and, right. and your voice matters. And, 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 and we hope that you will facilitate that uh, opportunity for your voice to be heard through through the political process and through voting. Right. Makes me think about technology. And um, you and I've talked about this before. Um, we don't really know each other, but we've had one Zoom call to get to know each other a little bit before this. And we talked about um, technology. And for me, I drive that engine at the Bitter Southerner. I, I'm doing all the Instagram posts and Twitter and Facebook and, and making sure that's where we've built our community is in social media. And that's how people know about what stories we're, we're publishing and, and what events we're doing and what books we're publishing and our podcasts. That's how people, it's the party every day, right? It's the place where people come to communicate with, with us and with each other. And, um, and you and I, when we talked about this, you are, um, you are more on the ground. You're out there in the world, you know, in real life. I know COVID has changed yes. some of that for this year, but talk yes. to me about that, about organizing. Well, 
Yeah, well, you know, I, I think in everything that we do, whether it be around leadership development or whether it be around our research or whether it be around our strategic communications, it's all done to organize people, you know, mm -hmm. whether, whether it be the people, the work that we do on the ground to organize folks around policy issues, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, a, it's about bringing people together in ways that will build power and disrupt unjust systems and institutions, right? And I think that, you know, one of the real blessings of PSE's evolution is that we understood the importance of strategic communications early in, in, in the power of language, right? in not just in itself, but also in, in the way that language and words can be a powerful connector, can be utilized as a powerful connector of people and be leveraged in a way that could assist us in, 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 in growing our ecosystem of institutions and individuals and frontline organizations that are working with us to advance racial equity in Georgia and the South, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I think we were in a, in a better situation than most organizations in the South that depend a lot on community engagement as a, a important, well, you know, face-to-face -face contact as right. a way to advance our agenda because we, we, we understood early on, again, that this fight for racial justice was not just about organizing people, right? But also about organizing ideas. Right, that, that it wasn't just about organizing ideas, but it was about advancing a values revolution right. um, um, that would create the conditions for the type of change that we want to see on the ground. So, so for us, I think we, the, the infrastructure was already being built over the years, almost 10 years now around the work. And so we were able to pivot somewhat quickly in leveraging a lot of our social media capacity. But with that being said, that there is nothing like um, being face-to-face -face right. with the community. I, I was actually, you know, a lot of people would be probably upset with this, but I was actually um, in, a, in a rural community this weekend um, doing an organizing training and, and a racial justice training because, because that is where the people are. And in, in some communities- Mm -hmm. why, would people be, why would people be upset about you being in a rural? What do you mean? Well, I think it's just because of the COVID-19 concerns, the okay. health concerns. And, and there were a lot of people um, who, and some people on my staff and others who support PSC, who want me to just stay in my house and, and try <laughs> to be a Twitter, a Twitter, uh, you know, a, a, a social media organizer, which is fine, right? Mm -hmm. We need right. We need those type of virtual, um, you know, organizers, and and their and and their need, the need for them is growing even more um, right now. And we actually do a training yeah, on virtual organizing. Hmm? Yeah, you had your mask on. You were fine. Yeah, I mean, everybody had masks on. Everybody, you know, we we were so you know did a social distancing thing, but. I mean, and, but nothing can, can take the place of that, right? Because, because at the end of the day, courage is a key component of the work and it's hard to cultivate courage behind the screen. I mean, you know, it, it's just, it, you know, to do the, and make the type of sacrifices that people need to make in, in order to move forward. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to kind of balance that, you know, that tightrope between, you know, being strategic about our, you know, engagement, you know, one of the things I did want to mention is that, you know, you know, so, so, you know, you know, I did that and will continue to try to support rural communities when I can, but we're also, um, you know, coming up, we're having a, a big summit on our client, you know, our climate justice right. and energy equity portfolio is having um, a summit um, in September, the Just Energy Summit. And, and you know, and, and, you know, we've had that now for the past six years and, you know, every other year, but we were forced this year to do it online. And, um, and you know, and because of we, we, we cared about the community and wanted to make sure that they were safe. So, so it's that tightrope that we have to walk, but I think we were positioned in a better way because, you know, that the piece around strategic communications is, 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 a th is, is a part of our theory of change and engagement. So, so it wasn't a hard pivot for us. It's what you do anyway. Yes, what we do, you know, you know, shaping, you know, shaping ideas, you know, um, you know, advancing a values revolution, as Dr. King talked about, 
is, is kind of the way that we see our, our responsibility as just as much as it is about building power on the ground, doing grassroots organizing and coalition building. Nathaniel, you talked about courage and it made me think about the courage and what the people who came before us, you know, John Lewis, yes, you know, like the courage that we have seen throughout history and the courage it takes right now, you know, to, um, to be out there with the truth, you know, yes. and, and speaking the truth and, 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 and moving things along. And then I, it made me think of you being out in the rural areas and how important it is to speak to um, our urban audiences and our rural audiences and make sure everyone's included. And it also made me think of uh, Michelle Obama's talk during the DNC convention when yes. she talked about put on a mask, when she's yes. talking about voting, put on a mask, pack yes. a lunch, maybe a dinner, expect to spend the night, get in line, social distance and vote. Like yes. that, there's, there's a lot of courage needed right now across, across everything, across voting, across how we um, are plain spoken and what's going on. And we just talk about the, what really, what has to happen and, and, and what we believe in and, being authentic and having courage is sort of uh, been the backbone of what we do at the Bitter Southerner. It's sort of been our underlying, you know, mantra to ourselves. Yeah, yeah. It, does this story, we, we always talk about running it through the filters. We have specific filters. Does this move um, these three or four things forward? Is That's this right. story doing that? Yeah, right. And, um, Anyway, courage, but you know what, courage but you know, on my mind. Right, but you know what, Cal? I mean, I think it's deeper than that, though, because it, it, in my opinion, it, it actually goes back to what we talked about before, and that's love, right? Because it, 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 love positions people to be courageous around certain issues. Right. Courage doesn't create love. Love creates courage, right? And, and, and you know, uh, you know, and, and not just the superficial love, but love as a transformational force, right? You know, right. one of the things that I always tell people, and I think Congressman Lewis and other great leaders who have sacrificed their, their whole lives for us to move forward as a nation understood one key real reality in my opinion and that is that equity is love in action right mm -hmm. that, that 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 the work that we do um as a community to advance a more just society is love in action and and the more that we're able to understand it the more that we're able to tap into that force right mm -hmm the more we'll see courageous actions and, and people standing up in ways. That's why we can't turn away from, from that force because you know, the opposite of love is fear. And we have people who are utilizing fear as a way to separate us, as a way to minimize um, our ability to, to organize ourselves and to push towards a better tomorrow. We always have to stay connected to that force and understand that that is really where our power lies. Not in the facts, not in not in the data. The data reinforces it, but that is not where 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 our power comes from. And and if we allow others to remove us from that force, right. then it'll be difficult for us to be successful. I love that love is the message. It is. It it, it is the force that um that we have to have and, and we also you know not to continue to go down this path but i think it's important for communicators to understand this that if that if equity is love and action right then empathy right we need empathy as well is the bridge between love and action right, right. that 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 if you don't take the time to create stories and create opportunities for people to fully understand what people are going through, right? Then they will they will not be put in a position to move from sympathy to empathy. Nathaniel, right? we are in the middle of the mo we have we have momentum right now. Yes. We've yes. just we we've just been through the most incredible few months 
and we have the world is you know sitting at attention and like what 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 is going on what how have how have i been thinking how do i need to change how do we move people from sympathy to empathy to action like how do how do we what do you talk about that well I, well i think it 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 really boils down and and i'm talking specifically for our communications family well, seizing the moment i'm talking about seizing this moment, moment. yeah mm -hmm. you know i i think one of the key things that we have to do um, is leverage, let, let me talk specifically to the communications people right now. Right. Um, you know, I think it's gonna be really, really important for them to play a role in elevating the stories of, 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 of the struggle of, of, of organizations and leaders that are working every day to advance racial justice. And, and, and it can't just be communities of color. I think, I think it is, you know, there's a reason why in schools we're not taught about John Brown, right? That we're not, that we're not taught about the, the, the folks that the abolitionists, right? Because, because there's power in that. And we can see that now through the uprisings with the diversity of, of in particular white kids and young people that are out protesting next to community the children of color because they understand that this is a moral moment that we have a movement moment and i think that similar to the civil rights movement and how media and communications play such an important role in amplifying the struggle of of african americans in the south during the 60s i think the communications community has to not only play a role in amplifying that those stories but also playing a role in assisting in developing the capacity of frontline organizations to tell the story. One of the, one of the things that most people don't understand or don't know is that the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, one of my favorite places I used to like to hide, right, was down in the basement of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And down in that basement was a printing press, right? So, so the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Dr. King's understanding of communications actually had a huge printing press, right, that he used at the time to, to leverage communications as a way to move the work forward. Right. And the last person that, that ran that was a gentleman by the name of Eddie Mathis. And I always like to mention these people because people will never know their names who, 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 um, who was around, I was around, of course, Dr. King was long gone, but he was the last person to, to, to manage that press. And so again, we've got to play a role in, 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 in translating printing presses, so to speak, throughout the South with the organizations that are moving this work forward. So, you know, strengthening the communications capacity of, of frontline leaders and organizations, continue to elevate the narratives and the stories that are required for us to move this work forward, in particular stories about white courage, um, I think is really important at this particular point. And also for the people that are not in, 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 in the communications community, um, to be bold and, and around the giving, the amount of funding that you're giving um, to organizations that are doing this work, um, ensuring that they have long-term support, general operating support, um, support that is um, 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 flexible and allows them to make mistakes and allows for in, um, innovation and uh, entrepreneurial attitude towards advancing this work. Um, and, and I think even more so a deep, deep commitment to moving from messages to meaning. And, and what do I mean by that? How do we begin the process to really translate this movement into policy change? and systems transformation, you know, because you can throw as much money as you can at a problem, but if you're not really working to disrupt the system and create policies that will move us forward, then all of this is ceremonial, in my opinion, and not real and actual. So, so just a couple of, of thoughts, you know, um, right. that I'm thinking. So what, what do you, I mean, from your perspective, what, what do you think are some of the things that um, the communications community should be doing um, or, or, or if, if I may, may be so presumptuous, because I, I do believe that you, you have a value. I mean, what should white Southerners be doing right now? Well, I have a question about something you just said. You said elevate white courage. Right. 
What did you mean by that? I would love to hear more about that. So, so I think, w- which is very similar, right? It's, it's very similar to the challenges that we face in, in our educational system, right? Where we, we don't learn about the acts of courage and the constant rebellion, right? That, that African-Americans and African slaves continue to press forward during chattel slavery. You know, we don't hear about, you know, like the opportunity, of, like what happened in North Carolina where, where blacks and whites got together and created a, a unified government that was, you know, that was the only coup on record in the country that occurred, right? right. Um, but with that being said, you know, and again, this is my, my personal opinion and, and, and some people may, may disagree, but, you know, African-Americans only make up 13% of the of the population of the United States, right? It's going to take others, right, right, to step up. But in order for those others to step up, they have to be willing to understand that they're not the first, right? right? That that there is a pathway to liberation, right? That they can play a part in helping to construct and create. But there are lessons again that they can learn from great people who came before them people who were involved in the abolitionist movement and other people. So they are part of a legacy as well. We so I don't have, I yeah. have a couple of thoughts. One right. is we all have to educate ourselves. Yes. 100%. Like, uh, in fact, when we start talking about doing this talk, I'm like, you know, I'm not a, a black history scholar. Like <laughs> I, I don't, but I've learned more. And I mean, I've been doing this work for seven years. Yeah. We've been publishing these stories, but I've done, and I've learned more in the last three months than I, I, I was, I'm, I was, I thought I was further along in my, you know, in my education about some things. So we have to open our minds and be, um, as communicators and people who are running communications departments and people who have a seat at the table at big corporations and organizations and nonprofits, we have to open our minds to what we don't know first right. and educate ourselves, read, um, read there's such a great reading list right now like there's an amazing group of books and in fact we're going to publish one this fall so look for that but Mm -hmm. um, but so read educate yourself and then um don't let this conversation die you know this is something that is not just a conversation it is if we want true change and we want what's right uh, then it's going to take all of us really bringing that inside our organizations, keeping it alive, getting involved, supporting organizations like yours, and um, ed- not only educating ourselves, but educating our employees and our staffs. And, you know, like, even at the Better Southerner, we've been around seven, e- seven years. We do three stories a week. You don't have to do the math. That's a lot of stories in seven <laughs> years. Um, and we have talked a lot about all of these issues but we didn't necessarily have the right people. No, let me rephrase that. We had really amazing writers writing for us all along, but we did not have enough voices of color. We did not have enough writers of color, photographers of color. And last summer, we we were like, we stopped and we had a retreat and we sat down and we're like, we've got to grow our staff. We're very tiny and we haven't had the money to grow, but. We've got to grow so that we are, are more diverse. So, and we have to start bringing in way more, um, you know, we have to have more diversity in our voices. And so we started last summer um, and we have made great progress in that. And, and we're seven years old. You know, and we're in the business of moving the South forward yes. and yes. being pro, um, you know, all of these things. So if we're just now getting around to doing some of those things, we're, we're all, we're on the same boat, educate yourself and then make actions to make things better. Take actions to make things better inside your organization and inside your own life. I mean, that's yeah. a very yeah. simple. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and I totally agree. I mean, I, you know, again, you know, I, I think it's beautiful to drive through gentrified communities and see black lives matter signs. Me too. You know, and, and it's great to see murals of Black folks, mm-hmm. even though in my city, the more murals I see, the more displacement we see as well of, of Black people from, from, from urban areas and cities. Right. You know, I love to, you know, it's great to see Facebook posts where people are giving their book lists and, 
and, and talking about anti-Blackness, but it takes more than that, right? It, it takes sacrifice, you know, and I always try to encourage my white friends to, to understand that it's not about what you're willing to give. It's about what you're willing to give up. Mm -hmm. And some of that's you're being comfortable. Yes, you've got to be willing to give up being comfortable. You have to be willing to give up your power. You have to be willing to give up your privilege. Um, the way that you see the world, sometimes people have to, to, to give that up as well. And so, um, but I think through great minds and, and, and leaders like you and, 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 and publications like The Bitter Southerner, I think we have an opportunity to touch an audience maybe that we've never been able to touch before. And so- I you feel know, like that's about so you, Nathaniel, and the work right. that y'all are doing. And I, and I wish I could look out at all the people that we're, we're talking with right now and say, I, w I wish we could meet all the folks in the audience. Don't you wish this was still in Atlanta? I, I, I really do. I, because I'd love to hear the stories of how people are implementing this inside their organizations and making real change. Because it's possible and it's exciting and the time is now. We, we've got is. to seize the moment, right? I mean, we have to, we are at what I call a, a movement moment. You know, mm -hmm. we're at a moment where um, we, we have to decide as a community whether we go right or left. And, you know, COVID-19 and the uprisings have elevated some hard truths and realities that we've tried to turn away from for the past 400 years in America. And the decisions that we make in these next couple of years will decide, in my opinion, whether America will be what it says it is or whether it will, at a most basic level, survive. I, I don't really think that we'll be able to survive um, you know, without us being able to work towards answering and, and, and solving some of the problems and questions that, that we have right now. So this is a very unique and special moment and, and we have to rise to the occasion. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm just hoping that people really understand that. Well, what's very cool is that I think the people watching this and that are attending this conference are the people who can do it. They're, they're, key, uh, they're, they're key to this. Anyway, thank you for talking with me today. I've loved every minute of it. Let, let me tell you, we, we've got to do this again without okay. a camera, without okay. a camera. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and again, as, as we kind of break the, the fourth wall, so to speak, you know, I, I do want to also take the time to thank everyone who took the time out of their busy schedules to spend time with us and, and, and listen to our conversation. We're very appreciative. I'm very appreciative. I'm sure Kyle is as well. And hopefully we'll see you out there on the battlefield. Yes. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.